Stranger, forgive our time. Wait, please be seated for a missions minute before we give our tithes and offerings. <laughs> We'd like your eyes. So we do have a missions minute from the ONBs tonight. I noticed that it's in the prayer sheets. That must mean the Lord wants you to hear it twice. Because I'm going to read it to you, and you can read it again later. Uh, the ONBs are our missionaries in Mongolia. Uh, we had the uh, blessing and privilege of being able to send them a care package within the last year, which they were very uh, grateful to receive. Uh, it's wonderful to be a blessing to our missionaries. Uh, greetings from the Gobi. We praise the Lord for another wonderful year in which to serve Him. Our hearts are ever grateful for the many cards, letters, and notes we've received simply checking on our family and health, as well as wishing us well and letting us know that we are constantly prayed for. It is very evident in our lives and ministry that prayer around the world is being offered up on our behalf to His glory. By the time you read this, we will have finished up the new Lunar New Year called Sagan Sar, that is, a celebration similar to Christmas, Thanksgiving, New Year's, Mother's Day, and Father's Day all rolled into one. I don't think Pastor would like that. We wouldn't have all these events, one or two or three a month. All the relatives visit and honor the grandparents and parents with food and gifts while wishing each other a prosperous time in the future. When I was reading this earlier, I read that food and gifts too fast, and I read food fights. I think that'd be kind of fun to have with your grandparents. I don't know. Maybe they got a lot of food fighting skills. I'm not sure. Anyway, our uh, Gobi and Bayan Delgar uh, congregations are coming along well, and we're excited about all the things the Lord is doing at our Baganer and Gur church with the herders. The Gur is the tent that the herders live in. Togo, who is their son, is doing a fine job with the youth group in Bible lessons and field activities. Some of the youth's parents that are favorably Buddhist became rather resentful that their children were learning about gospel Christianity. Some contacted the local chief who promptly came by and threatened our group with expulsion if we didn't cease and desist. The pastor and I discussed all that was taking place with the chief and he has taken a wait and see attitude toward our outreach efforts. He's not hostile toward our church but has to maintain a semblance of authority regarding his herders. 
We explained that our evangelistic purpose and that humanitarian aid to the herders is also necessary. Several of our herders want all of you to know that they are very grateful for all of the material, like Bibles, songbooks, clothing, food, etc., that you provide through your prayers and support. Several of our herders are poorer folks and could not survive without your assistance. We recently procured a couple of sets of prescription glasses for two of our elderly herders so that they can read and meditate on their new Bibles, as well as completing their assignments in their Bible lessons. The ophthalmologists here are very strict and will not tender a product until the appropriate examination and testing are done. Some of the herders are a little leery of them, though, and prefer to use a handheld magnifying glass. I'd have a hard time seeing William walking around school with a magnifying glass. We're hoping to consolidate all of our Bible classes during the week into a solid midweek service that will limit the amount of interruptions in the herders' husbandry activities. Please remember this in prayer, as several of the herders want the Bible studies at their GER. Maintaining unity is a major concern here. One of our men that we mentioned previously, Brother Batbold, has ventured into the adjoining province called Dornhood and is leading a new Bible study group there. He's praying that the group's growth continues as we are actively assisting him in his evangelistic pursuits. He's been to the Henty province, province prison with us several times and is one of the best all-around people persons that I've seen here. He's able to work with the staff as well as the inmates and administrators. Also, our friend Beira, who transferred from the Cheer prison to the Henty prison, has told us that the new Mongolian law may reduce his remaining time, and he hopes to be released very soon. He continues to lead his group of believers at the prison and always enjoys our time together. In mid-February, we went to the Baganur prison and enjoyed a time of fellowship with a group of inmates that were being rewarded for their good behavior. Most of them were above 60 years old or had no family to help or visit them. We shared the gospel and prayed with them and brought them food and gifts and scheduled a future appointment with the new warden for setting up Bible and English classes with the staff and inmates. The warden is very open to allowing us to come in and minister any way possible. Please remember this in prayer. Our family is doing well. My health is continuing to improve and we are looking forward to our upcoming summer camps. We are considering the possibility of taking our church camp into Russia in June or July and that you would pray for our journey and for safety. The new Mongolian law allows for Mongols to visit Russia without the need of a visa. However, as an American, I will have to procure permission to enter. Keep looking up. His wife is Mongolian, so that's, that's where they need to, uh, to come up with a, a path for him to enter the country. But praise the Lord for the work that uh, he's doing through the ONBs in Mongolia. Let's pray for the offering. Dear Lord, we do thank you for our time here tonight. We thank you for uh, reminding us of the work that's going on around the world that we have the privilege to support. Lord, I pray that you would help us to remember to give cheerfully uh, to support these efforts of buying Bibles and uh, glasses for people to read the Bibles. Lord, for people, um, converts in prison that are being ministered to. Uh, we thank you for all of these things that uh, our support here goes to fund. Uh, Lord, we pray also for the offering for our own local church, Lord, that you would continue to support and sustain us. Bless those that give, that give with a cheerful heart, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good evening. If you would please turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Praise the Lord for this church. God has been really good to us. Um, I have to say, when I first met Pastor, I automatically believed that God sent me a bodyguard. Um, praise the Lord. I, were ta I was talking to my wife this afternoon, and we were talking about how grateful we are to have a church family, to have friends, and, and uh, to have my parents here, and to have family around us is great. Um, God is always good, and we appreciate you very much, church family. Thank you for all your prayers and, and everything that you uh, put together for this church. Um, very grateful for that. Today's subject is going to be about spiritual warfare and having a spiritual warfare mentality. Uh, we will look through scriptures, and uh, the scriptures will reflect the spiritual warfare mentality. And also, we're going to be looking at the, at, at the life of Elijah at, through his eyes. We're going to look at his motives and, and see how Elijah was uh, very confident in God. And you'll see how. Let's read uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, starting with verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elijah, Behold now the place where we dwell thee to straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and make thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. One said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was falling, felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he, sh and he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and cast it thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee, and put out his hand, and took it. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel, and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was so troubled for this thing, and he called his servants and said unto them, Will thee not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elijah the prophet. It is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither and horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we dwell? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain full of horses and chariots fire around, around about Elijah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just pray now, Lord, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. And let me say the things that you desire me to say. And let me be just a vessel used by you for your glory and honor. We pray now that, God, that you would speak to hearts, Lord, that tonight would be victorious. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we read here that Elijah had his own mission to execute. We read that King Syria was ready to go to war with Israel. And, we, and, and King Syria had an issue. His issue was Elijah. Elijah was in the way of King Syria. Of the king of Syria. And we see that Elijah had a young servant with him. And this young servant perhaps was afraid or he was uh, coming to a point where he just felt that this was the end of his life. 
What this, year, sir, what this young servant of Elijah was able to see was more than what met his eyes. More than what met his eyes. If I had a title to this message, it would, it would be, There is more to our battles than what meets the eye. Fear pumping through his soul might have been a, something in him. Hearing the voice of Elijah saying, Fear not, might have been one of the hardest words to obey. So then when Elijah begins to pray, he prays in verse 17 to open his eyes that he may see. To, get, to see God sent arm, army ready to destroy the Syrians had to been an eye opening to this young servant. There's more to our battles than what meets the eye. There's more to our inconveniences, our personal issues, our pain, our persecutions, our distress, our trials, our temptation, our broken spirit. There's more to our battles than a spiritual war. And we are in the battle. What we face is not a fairy tale made believe Tim Burton produced cartoon. What we face is a war with an enemy who hates God's living creation. You know, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He, he is, he is high-minded, but the Bible says he's going to be defeated. What we face is rulers of darkness of this world. We face spiritual wickedness in high places. But I praise the Lord that God has given us his word to tell us how to fight the enemy. I praise the Lord that God has given us his word to expose the strategies of our enemies. We see in, in scripture that in John 4.4 4, that he is the father of lies. In 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, he is the little God of this world. He is the adversary. He is a roaring lion. He is a deceiver. He is the, the thief of sheep. He is the accuser of the brethren. We know the enemy is, is, is fighting full-time, 24-7, every single day. He's fighting and he's attacking day by day. Right now, he's attacking. He's attacking. He's attacking. He's attacking with his armies. He's attacking people. He, he's attacking them to, so that they can stand or stay in depression or stay in oppression. He's attacking to, to, to make things worse so that no one can shine the light of Jesus Christ. Someone is trying to seek the Lord, but he's attacking the word of God. He's attacking the hearer of God's word. He's manipulating the truth of God so that they can never get near salvation. He's attacking a, a young teenager that is in school. He's attacking uh, people with pressure and he's attacking them with pleasures, possessions, and, and power. He's attacking in, in ways to distract us from spending any time with God. He's attacking to take territory in our mind, emotions, and will. He's attacking so that no soul or no person in this world can ever get saved. He's attacking so that our spirit can remain asleep and do any, nothing for God. Someone is trying to live for Christ, but Satan is attacking them by condemning their past. Someone is trying to believe and seek the Lord, but he, he's attacking to talk, he's attacking in our churches to cause discord. He's attacking so that no one can have a godly testimony. And he plans to ruin our testimony. There's more to our battles than what meets the eye. Not only does God expose our enemy, but he also reveals a war within our inner man. That is our, our soul. Our soul is our mind, emotions, and will. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 6, This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, for the lust for the flesh lusted against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. <clears throat> and these are contrary one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Society tells us that there's, there's a different way for satisfaction. When things are not going their way, the, the worldly people just lean on pleasing the flesh. When things are inconvenient, they just lean on just their own they lean on their own pride or their own self-will to make things happen. When things are going bad, they 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 they, they lean on uh, every any everything else in their powers and then perhaps maybe God uh, here and there. But there but, but today at work there is a couple of guys who were stressing out and their solution was smoking a, smoking a cigarette. And and it's what pleases their flesh. 
There's more to our inner battle than what meets the eye. When we go through inconveniences or when we have pressures in our lives and we get stressed out and there's things going in our lives that are hard to deal with at times, we can lean on scripture where it says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. We know that good and bad circumstances work together for good. And we question at times, why are things happening so bad? Well, when things are happening bad, is we, we, we have the option, we have the choice. We can choose to, to yield to the fruit, we can yield to God, we can say, okay God, what exactly would you want me to do with this situation that I'm going through? What is it that you have for me at this time that, that I'm obviously not uh, understanding? And sometimes God will bring pressures like that in our lives so that our soul can leak the Holy Spirit through us. But see, the hardest thing to do is recognize that this circumstance is for a reason. And when we go, okay, Lord, let thy will be done at that point. God may just start breaking you. Why? Because it's something that you're not wanting to do. There's things that we know to do right at that inconvenient time, but it's going against what we want to do. And when we go, what we, when we go against what we want to do, our, our, our soul tends to break just a little bit. And then we have all types of issues in our lives that sometimes can just stress us out just a little bit and it, and it keeps going and going and going until you say enough is enough. I don't know how to handle this. I need you, oh God, I need you. And our spirit begins to break little by little. So why? So that the Spirit of God can leak through us. We, we know that, we know the scriptures where it says, Count it all joy when he fall into divers temptation, knowing this at the trying of your faith, work it patience. But how can we find joy in the midst of, of, of a broken spirit? How can we find joy in the midst of, 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 of trials and tribulations? How can we count it all joy? Well, the flesh can't, but the spirit can. And when we begin to say, okay, okay, God, things are going horrible, but I know you're a living Savior. I know you can help me through this. I know you can, and start believing in Jesus Christ at that moment, it's not going to feel good. It's not a, a, a very satisfying feeling, but the Holy Spirit begins to work through you, and you begin to realize that it's, it's all Him, and there's no way that you were able to overcome that, because it was just so much for you at that moment. If we are ever going to be effective in our battles, we need to make a sacrificial decision to modify our wants and yield to his desire. Romans 8.13 says, If we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. To live is to live the crucified life. Mortifying our flesh, fleshly desires and the only person that can bring us to victory is Jesus Christ. The battle begins in our minds. The Bible says, For the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. A stronghold is what makes a, what makes a prisoner in his mind. This causes him to think that there's no hope, solution to the problem. A, a imagination is a false belief about the person's helpless situation. In his imagination, he sees a monster or scary situation where the person sees himself alone, unloved, abandoned, or facing a scary, uncertain future. In his imagination, he sees himself a prisoner living without hope or chance of parade. Sinful behavior, bitterness, fear, guilt, shame is usually the cause of these satanic thoughts. And the Bible says to pull them down and cast them down. But it's not, it's not just pulling them down and casting down. It's, it's also after you pull them down and cast them down, it's meditating in the Word of God. If you meditate day and night, the Bible says you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in its season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever you do it shall prosper. So we can pull down and we can cast down, but we have to replace our mind with God's Word. 
it's not going to work if we just cast them. There's a thought and just let go of, or, or just not read your Bible at all or meditate or study the Word of God. There has to be a consistency if we are ever going to win our battles with those inconveniences. Now God has given us His Word to tell us how to, how to fight in our battles and He has given us His Word to tell us how to put on an armor. There's an armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. If you can go there with me, Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of this darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that he may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all firing darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation, and the, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. With this armor that we have, it's an armor that we have to constantly put on if we're ever going to be effective in our battles. And, then, and this armor that we have, it's not just praying and letting it in, that's it. It's not just reading the Bible and that's it. There's more to our battles than what meets the eye. It's stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Can we say... Stand therefore having your mind girt about with truth. To be equipped with knowledge of truth. To understand who you are in your position in the mission that you're in in this battlefield. To understand who you are at that moment with Jesus Christ when you're standing in a battle. When you are in a position where your thoughts are not being righteous in a position where you're being condemned by Satan to do less for the cause of Jesus Christ. In a position where you might, you, you might feel anxiety. In a position where you might just feel distressed or things are not going right for you. and it, it, Or it can just be that you need to know at that moment where you stand with Jesus Christ. And Scripture tells us that Scripture tells us who we are in Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, I am a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And 1 Peter 2.9 says, I am a peculiar person to show forth the praises of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.10, I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus into good works. In John 1.12, I am a child of God. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, I am made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. In John 4.4, 4, I am an overcomer in Jesus Christ. In Colossians 2.10, I am complete in him. 2 Corinthians 2.16, I have, I have the mind of Christ. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. Romans 8.37, 30, I am more than a conqueror through him. There's much more than our battles and what meets the eye. It is important that we know our truths. It is important that we know where we stand in the Word of God when there is a battle. It's very, very, very important. You may not feel like quoting that scripture. You may not feel you're like an, over an overcomer. Or you may not feel you're like a conqueror in any way. But those scriptures are there for a reason. 
they're there just in case, hey, you're, you're being attacked by the enemy and there is oppression and there's, and there's a heavy load of, of, of things going around you, but you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. you. You are more than an overcomer. You are a conqueror. When Satan condemns you from your past and, and he starts saying things about you, you don't have to listen to those lies. You don't have to listen to what he has to say because God's word says something different than you're hearing in your mind, if that is the case. And then we go on putting on the breastplate of righteousness. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We can never measure up to the righteousness of God. There is none righteous, the Bible says, but we were made righteous in Jesus Christ when we became born again. God will, of course, judge us according to our behavior. And when we make unrighteous decisions, God will judge us. But there's also the law of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 8, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. When we sow righteousness, there is a reward in heaven, but there's also promises in the Word of God that will help us in our battles by being righteous. The Bible says that, the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 1, the righteous are bold as a lion. Psalms 1, 6, the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. Psalms 5, 12, for thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor, will thou compass him as with the shield. Psalms 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Righteous living gives confidence in God's abilities in our battles. If you live in wickedness, there's the opposite, insecurities. There's uh, a, a confusing path. There's, a, there, there's no favor from God. There, there's just a separation with you and God when, when you are unrighteous. But when you go to heaven and you're saved, but yet you live in an unrighteous life, God will judge you. But through Jesus Christ, you are made righteous and you will enter into the kingdom of God. But we don't want to go there with sin in our lives. We, we want to go there with with, of course, through Jesus Christ, He has made us clean, we, He has cleansed us, but we don't want to go there with a baggage of, I should have done a lot more for Jesus Christ than, than what I did or what I, or what I didn't do. Number three is preparation of the gospel of peace. What makes, a bat, what makes our battles easier is to handle it is, is when we think of others there are millions of people who have no real peace. They are in need of a soul winner to show them how to have the Prince of Peace. When we begin to, to start having a mentality of soul winning, the battles that we face become a little easier. Because you're not so much thinking about your issues, you're thinking about others. You're thinking about their lives. And when you put on the mind of a soul winner, there's, there, there, is a, there is a need for people to have peace. There's a need for people to have the Prince of Peace. There's a need for them to, to know how to get saved. So it's very important to have a mind of a soul winner in our battles. And ver number four, oh, and point four, above all, taking the shield of faith, above all, taking the shield of faith, our faith in Christ is what puts our, puts is what puts his wicked Satan's wicked influences out. Your faith in the Word, your faith in what God can do in, through, and for your life. Our lives living in the faith of Christ is what keeps us standing. And Galatians three twenty says, "I am crucified." Galatians two twenty says, "I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live; yet not I, but Christ liveth in me." And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. You know, God has given us his spirit to demonstrate faith. When the disciples could not cast out the unclean spirit from, from that man, we read in the Bible, they couldn't. Jesus says, well, this cometh by fasting and prayer. But they asked a very important question. They said, why can't we cast out this unclean spirit? Because of lack of faith. Going back to a mind of a soul winner, we can knock on a door and that's pretty easy. We can give out a track, but 
Let's ask a question. Let's go ahead and ask a question. What can we do to help the schizophrenic? What can we do to help the bipolar? What can we do to help the depressed? What can we do to to help? Why can't we help the bipolar? Why can't we help the depressed? Why can't we help the schizos? Why why can't we help the addictions? Well, we can. By faith. By fasting and prayer. Putting on the shield of faith. Taking on the helmet of salvation. I'm trying to remember this. Someone said about someone said this story about Satan was on his throne, and there was three demons. Satan was looking for a faithful demon, and one of his demons said, Oh, pick me, pick me. I will make sure that they will continue in their addictions and stay in bondage and and uh, and do wickedness and he says, no, that's not good enough. And another demon said, oh, pick me, pick me. I, I, I want to be on the throne. Pick me, pick me. I, I'll, you know what? I'll make them think that they're doing good, that they're living a good life. And he says, no, that's not good enough. And the other one said, pick me, pick me. I'll make them read their Bibles. I'll make them go to church. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let them soul win. I'll let them do things for, the, for, for Christ. But I'll never get them saved. We need to recognize sometimes that we are saved. We need to make sure that we, ha we put on the helmet of salvation. To be 100% sure that when we die we'll go to heaven is, a, is, is much confidence in this battle. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that a man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. There's more to obeying the Word of God than what meets the eye. For the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrows. It is a discerner of thoughts and tents of the heart. Proverbs 35 says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. 2 Peter 1, 19-21 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn, and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the, prophet, for the prophecy came not in old time by, the, time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God gave in old times a prophet to speak to man. Elijah the prophet had a heart to protect God's chosen people. We, we read that in 2 Kings chapter 6. And but in 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 9 says, And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once nor twice. And the king of Israel, so the king of Israel wisely considered Elijah's warning. There is more to obeying the word of God than what meets the eye. Trusting in his word is clearly seen in our victories. The battles that we face are won by because God has shown us how to win. Jesus won his battles of temptation by saying, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. When we obey the word of God and we find victory, Satan will bring new levels of new devils after that victory. You see, in 2 Kings chapter 6, 11 and 13, suddenly things were not going to plan for the king of Syria and had heard that Elijah gave strategy information to the king of Israel. So he sent spies to find him in Dothan and surrounds Elijah with an army. That just makes me think how, how before we are ever attacked by satanic uh, oppressions or, or, or thoughts, uh, Satan and his demons begin to spy just a little bit. They, they begin to f spy to find what gets your heart pumping to sin or where your weaknesses are at, where your fears are at, or what distracts you from spending any time with God. The enemy, will st the, the enemy has studied man's character's patterns so well that he can discern your next move unless, of course, God has his way with you. There's more to, there's also, there's more to prayer than what meets the eye. 
In 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 15 and 23 says, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host come past the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Elijah had confidence in God's protection, and his servant was in need of prayer in time of attack. Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of this young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountains was full of horses and chariots fire round about Elijah. He had comfort in having God by his side. In having God by your side is measured on how close you are with God. Your prayer life, your Bible devotions, your trust in Him, your faith. And when they came down to him, Elijah prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite these people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elijah. Prayer is warfare. After these men were blinded, I don't think they were foolish enough to pursue their mission. Elijah was a merciful man. He could have asked God to smite them, but instead he prayed that God would blind them to remove them away from their attack. You know, how many of us pray that God will remove any satanic oppressions? How many of us pray that God will blind the eyes of our neighbors from their wickedness? You know, how many of us pray that God will blind us from going astray. There's more to prayer than what meets the eye. And Elijah said in verse 19, And Elijah said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. Elijah, Elijah led the way. You know, someone said prayer comes with action. Pray for someone, then be the example by leading the way. You know, there's a song that goes, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hallelujah, this little light of mine. And then it goes, and it goes and it goes and, it, and it, there's a verse, there's a song there. It goes, there's a verse there that says, "Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine." If we begin to pray for someone, and it's a spiritual warfare out there. And we begin to pray that God will blind their way. And things might go uncomfortable with them. Things might go crazy with them because they're not seeing straight. You know, they're, suddenly their, their ways are, are confusing. They thought they had it all together. They, they said, well, I, they, they say I don't need God because I have my life going good. Or they say, I don't need a Savior because, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to heaven because I've done so many good things. But how about we start praying that God will blind them and then things will start going another way for them and then we can be the example by, le by leading the way. Sometimes God puts us in uncomfortable situations to get right with them because someone is praying for us to see where we are spiritually. And the king of Israel said unto Elijah when he saw them in verse 21, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I spite them? So we see Elijah leading them to Samaria. And God prayed that God will open their eyes again. That must have been very uncomfortable to them. But Elijah had mercy. And instead of the king having his way with them, Elijah showed mercy and gave them water and food. Elijah could have finished them in Dothan for their attempt to kill Elijah, but instead he prayed that God will blind them and led them into what seemed to be their prison or the end of their lives at Samaria. Elijah instead feeds them with water and food 
See, Elijah understood very well that his battle was not with these men, but with the evil one. Elijah gave these men to God in prayer. There's more also, number four, there's more to sin than what meets the eye. Sin is what keeps us defeated. It is an open door for Satan to take territory in our minds. Sin also binds us from the truth. If you're having no victory because of sin, please make the choice tonight to repent by confessing and getting right with God. A while ago, I received a letter from Reformers Unanimous. And this letter is a letter about a lady in the home who wrote a letter, a letter to Satan. And it says, Dear Satan, I had a lot on my mind. I wanted to drop you a line to get some things off my chest that I have been holding in. I know we don't hang out anymore, but there is a good reason. You were the worst friend I ever had. You lied to me. You deceived me. You told me we were going to be best friends. And I believed you. I never thought you would have hurt me the way you did. How could I have been so blind? They tried to warn me about you, but I wouldn't listen. I heard it almost daily in the Christian school. And every Sunday from the pastor, still, I wouldn't listen. He told me they didn't know what they were talking about. He told me they were just trying to keep me from having fun, from living my life. I believed you. At first, it seemed as though you might have been telling me the truth. We were having some great times together. We could stay out all night and go to the parties, do all the drugs, and hit up all the clubs. This had to be the right way, right? I mean, my friends were right there with me. How could this be wrong if so many were doing, doing it? I remember being worried at times that I may become addicted to this lifestyle or to some of the drugs I, cat, uh, cat I was using. Of course, you were always right there to whisper in my ear your reassurance that I wouldn't. You said I was just having my fun while I was young, sowing my wild oaks. Again, it seemed as if, as if you might have been telling the truth. I was being blessed by the world's standards. I grew older, I got a job, I was married, had brought a nice house and thought I had left my past of partying behind. He told me I should be happy with all this, but I wasn't. Something was missing. He started reminding me of the good times we, we used to have back in the good old days. Remember how good those pain pills used to make you feel and how they just took all your worries away? Again. I bought into your lies. This time there was no stopping us. We ran hard, and before I knew what had happened, I was addicted. The thing you promised would free me and had given me complete bondage. I had shackles on my feet and wrist. Instead of being friends, I became a slave, and you were the slave master. You beat me all day, every day. I thought the only way out was death and you were fine with that. I didn't, I didn't die though, but was so far gone that I had to go away to get help. You still came too. Every day you were right there trying to get me to leave the safe haven, pointing out every flaw in the place. Guess what? I found a new best friend while I was there. His name is Jesus. The funny thing is he was the one I was searching for all along. He filled the void instantly that you had promised to fill for all those years. Following him doesn't come with consequences, it comes with blessings. You stole everything from me. He gave me more than, I de he gave me more than I, what I deserved. I don't know how I could have been so blinded to all your lies while the truth was right there in front of me the whole time. He had his nail pierced hands extended, just waiting. He has promised that he'll, he will never leave me, he'll never leave my side or forsake me. And guess what? He hasn't. When life gets tough, I can deal with it. I can deal with it. He's right there to take the burdens from me. You know what else? I don't have to spend eternal, eternity burning in a lake of fire. Too bad you can't, say, you can't say the same. Yeah, he already told me how your story ends. Wish I could say I was sorry, but I'm not. I gave you a lot of my life 
with now with nothing but regret to show for it. And now I'm giving Christ the rest. I know that I was nothing more than a notch on, on your belt. And there are plenty more out there who fall victim to your lies daily. I pray for them. I pray their eyes will be opened. And they'll see you for what you are, a liar. You may at times win battles, but Christ has already won the war. You might st still be here, but you have already been defeated. Just thought I'll tell you a little bit about how I felt about you. Can't wait to see you burning in hell sincerely. And the name's right there, but I'm not going to say it. You know, hell is a real place. People are burning right now as we speak. Are we going to let our battles get in the way? The inconveniences, our, our stresses, our whatever it is. Are we going to pray for those who are in need? Are we going to do something for the Lord? Something big? It's okay to dream. Dream big for the Lord. It's okay. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you now, Lord. We appreciate you and we thank you for your word and how your word speaks to us. And Lord, we understand that there's an enemy out there and he hates us and he doesn't like what we're doing. And he's attacking every, every moment, Lord, that passes. And Father, we pray now that you would help us, Lord, to prepare ourselves for our next battle. That you would... Give us, Lord, great confidence that we would put on the whole armor of God, that we may be able, Father, to approach this life with all faith in you, Lord. And God, help us to be prayer warriors and help us to be Bible meditators and, and help us to be soul winners, Lord. And, and thank you for this church that gives us that opportunity, Lord, to, to help people and to, and to be more effective in our battles, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing and for what you will do if we trust in you, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Thanks, Brother Guerra. Praise the Lord. If you would turn uh, in your hymnal to number 55, we'll be singing that in just a second, number 5-5. Five, five. After this lo uh, last song, uh, you'll be dismissed. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at Soul Winning tomorrow night at 7 or at Prayer and Outreach on Saturday morning at 10. Uh, don't forget to set your clock forward one hour and be ready at uh, 9.45 for Sunday school. And uh, greet one another as we go. Uh, hymn number 55. cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Let's stand as we sing verse 2. Was it for crimes that I have done? He groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Thank you. If you can stay for prayers, please do so. Come to the front and you'll be paired up. Otherwise, you are dismissed.